Amen. Praise God. It's great to be with you this morning. And um, we've been going through the um, the I am statements of Jesus and learning more about who he is and what he has done. And my iPad's going to freeze right in the middle of my sermon right here. So you don't want to ad lib sermon from, from me. So we'll just reopen that. But we're learning about the I am statements of Jesus and we're learning about, of course, about who Jesus is. Um, Because what what more important question than that? Uh, Who is Jesus? And what better place to go to learn about Jesus than to go to the Gospels and to find out specifically who Jesus said, uh, who Jesus said that he was. And so this morning we're going to be talking about I am the door. I am the door. Before we do, let me pray for us one more time. Uh, King Jesus, uh, it is a privilege to be here this morning. Thank you for the brothers and sisters that you've brought here today. I believe with all my heart, you have something you want to say to each and every one of us today. And so, Lord, let us, let our hearts not be hardened. Let us not be proud. But let us humble ourselves under your truth. Humble ourselves under your word. Let us say what that young boy Samuel said all those years ago. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So incline our hearts to you. Show us what it means that you are the door, Lord. We want to know. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you have a Bible, I'm going to ask you to turn to John chapter 10. Uh, if you don't have a Bible on hand with you, there should be one in the, in, in, the front of, in front of you, in the back of the pew, right behind you. I encourage you to grab that because um, uh, you're going to want to look at the text, uh, have it there with you, and be able to follow along with me. Um, if you don't have a Bible today, you don't have one at your home that you can read, you take one of those pew Bibles out the back. That's our gift f- for you. We want you to have that so you can have God's Word uh, with you uh, back at home. So today we're going to continue through the I am statements of Jesus. Um, Jesus, one analogy that we could say about Jesus is he's like the, the most finely crafted jewel that has ever existed. And so if you've ever looked at a fine jewel, it has many facets, right? And, and every angle that you hold it and adjust it, you get the shimmer from a different facet of the jewel. And so every angle at which you look at Jesus, you see something new and beautiful about him that you might not have seen before. And so we've talked about how uh, Jesus is um, uh, uh, the bread of life. We talked about how Jesus is uh, the light of the world. Okay, we're going to see many other things about what Jesus is, but today we're talking about how Jesus claimed that he is the door. And of course, that raises a lot of questions. What does it mean that that Jesus is the door. He's the door to what? You know, um, what, is all, what all does that mean? Well, that's what we're going to talk about this morning as we talk about I am the door. From John chapter 10, John chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. If you're able and willing, I invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's holy, perfect, inerrant word. John chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The Word of God. You may be seated. Okay, so so we're going to look at this passage. We're going to explore it under three headings this morning. Number one, beware the thieves. 
beware the thief. Number two, enter through the door. Enter through the door. And then number three, know you're a sheep. Know that you're a sheep. So the first thing we're going to look at is beware the thieves. All right? So the first thing when you look at a passage of Scripture that you have to ask is, what's going, what's going on here? All right? What, what, what's happening? What's taking place? That's a question about context, right? In biblical interpretation, context is king. Everybody say, context is king. All right, you got it. So what's happening in the story? What's happening to Jesus here and why? Well, you, to understand the beginning of John 10, you have to look at John chapter 9. And you can look right there in the Bibles that you have open and see what's happening in John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, Jesus has, has performed this incredible miracle where he healed a man who was born blind from birth. Okay? And the disciples asked him, uh, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. So they just assumed that uh, they just assumed that the fact that he was born blind was a punishment from God for some kind of sin in either his life or his parents' life. Okay, but Jesus says that it was neither. That the reason he was born blind was for the glory of God. Did you know that what the world might consider a hardship or a handicap might not be a problem in God's eyes, but might be nothing, but be, be, for, be there nothing for nothing other than the very glory of God to be displayed in your life. Fanny Crosby was a blind hymn writer who wrote over 9,000 hymns. Uh, the publishers made her use a, a pen, different, various types of pen names. Because they didn't want their hymn books full of nothing but Fanny Crosby songs. So they made her change the name, pen name on some of the songs. She wrote so many hymns. A pastor told Miss Crosby one time, quote, I think it's a great pity that the master did not give you sight when he showered so many other gifts upon you. Fanny Crosby responded, Do you know that if at birth I had been able to make one petition, it would have been that I was born blind? Because when I get to heaven, the first face that shall ever gladden my sight will be that of my Savior. There are things better than seeing with your eyes. Like seeing Jesus. And Fanny understood that. In this man's case, God, uh, in this blind man's case, right, God wouldn't be glorified by his hymn writing, but what it was is that his blindness would, a, a occasion, uh, would furnish an occasion for Jesus to heal him and display God's glory. And so Jesus put mud in his eyes and told him to go wash, and he was healed. And it was a God-glorifying, Christ-exalting miracle that caused quite a stir among the people uh, in, that, uh, in that area. And so the Pharisees, if you, if you look at, in chapter 9, they're, they're completely compassionless about this whole occasion, right? Because uh, here's a man who is, was born blind, and he was healed, okay? So he's literally like, you know, he's ecstatic because he's literally seeing for the first time. And despite the fact that he's literally right there in front of their eyes, and a great miracle has been done by God, but the Pharisees are angry, because Jesus healed him on a Sabbath. Ooh. We got to beware of having twisted priorities. When it reaches a point where we can't rejoice in what God is doing because it's not happening the way we think it should happen. That's what the Pharisees were doing. So what, is, so, what's going, so what happens? They confront the man who was born blind, and he's basically like, you know, I don't know what happened. I, I barely know what's going on. The only thing I know is that I was blind, but now I see. And then he goes on to say, and as far as I know, only a man from God could do that. It's basically, I mean, it's irrefutable logic, and the Pharisees just get mad and run him out. They literally run him off. Okay, when he tells them that. Okay, and so Jesus later meets this man and reveals who he is, and the man believes him, all right? 
And at the end of chapter 9, and you can look there, the last couple of verses of chapter 9 there, Jesus is confronting the Pharisees about their own spiritual blindness. And so what's the, what's the story, right? This man was blind, and the Pharisees thought that they, they thought they saw clearly. And then Jesus comes along and says, actually, you think you see, but you're actually the blind one. Because you actually can't see the most important thing there is to see, and that is Jesus is from God. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's the King. All right? And so when you understand that, and then you look at John chapter 10, because immediately he begins going into this sheep analogy, a sheepfold analogy, and that, that those who enter in by another way are a thief and a robber, I, it seems quite clear to me that he must be referring to the thieves and robbers. Uh, he's referring to the religious leaders. Okay, and so in John chapter ten, right, we have a ma- ma- man who is born blind, but the power of Christ through the power of Christ now sees. All right, so the man born blind who now sees Christ for who he is and believes in him, he represents the sheep. Every person who would come to true understanding of who Jesus was, who would see Jesus, if you will, for who he really is, that person is a sheep, a sheep in the flock of God, and those who would. But those who don't see that and refuse to see that, and in fact, which would work to turn other people away from that truth, Jesus says, are thieves and robbers. Okay? And that's what the religious leaders were doing. And almost certainly, the, religious, uh, the, the scriptural background in Jesus' mind from this parable is Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 2 through 6. And it says, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, and do, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, you, you law, uh, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered all over the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. You see, the Pharisees were so sure that they saw clearly that they couldn't see the most obvious fact that Jesus was the true shepherd from God. And rather than caring for God's sheep, they abused them and took advantage of them. And so... So then Jesus, with that background, is talking about the, the, the sheepfold analogy, okay? And this passage is a little complicated because he, he, he seems to kind of go back and forth between different analogies or looking at the analogy from a slightly different way, all right? But the initial analogy is the one with a sheepfold, all right? So um, in, a sheep, in, a, in an ancient sheepfold, right, you would, it would be a, 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 an enclosure of some sort where the flocks would stay. And... Um, and, and in some cases, you might have more than one flock in a sheepfold, all right? So you might have more than one person's flock or more than one shepherd's flock within a particular sheepfold. And then there was a gate and, with a gatekeeper, okay? So the gatekeeper would be a kind of another shepherd-type person, but clearly the gatekeeper would know whose flocks are in the sheepfold. And so when the shepherd came up and said, hey, I'm here to get my sheep out of the sheepfold so I can take them out to pasture and to feed them, right? The gatekeeper would know which shepherd, you know, which, who, which shepherd goes to which flock within the sheepfold, all right? And so the gatekeeper would recognize who the true shepherds were and who weren't because he wouldn't let just anybody in to just waltz out with somebody else's sheep, okay? And so anyone who tried to enter the sheepfold by a different way other than the gate was a thief and a robber. If you didn't try to enter the sheepfold to take the sheep out in a legitimate way, you were trying to steal the sheep, and the sheep didn't really belong to you. And so only only the true shepherds would be able to enter the gate of the sheep. So so the first lesson from this passage is to beware the thieves and the robbers. Beware the thieves and the robbers. Now, for most pastors, I believe most pastors are genuine, salt-of-the-earth kind of guys who are trying to serve the Lord as faithfully as they can. I, I'll let you judge me and Ron for yourself. But most pastors I know are the real deal, and they're doing the best they can with what they have to try to lead Christ's sheep. Um, you, know, in a, uh, you know, in an average-sized 
you know, in a normative size church, which isn't very large, I think the average church size is like 60 or 70 like that. I mean, you know, most of the time you're not making a killing, all right? You know, when I, when I graduated college, you know, my parents, and I love my parents to death, but I think initially they thought I was kind of crazy for just throwing away engineering to become a pastor. But I, had, I felt God's calling on my life. This is what God called me to do. So when God calls you to do something, you better do it. All right? And so, and so but, but we have to beware because there are, there are those out there. One of the most repeated warnings in the New Testament is the warning against false teachers. Right? It's one of the most repeated warnings in the New Testament. And teachers and shepherds will be judged with a stricter judgment. And so what, what churches, what every church needs to do, what this church needs to do, what mature churches do to guard against false teachers is by being relentlessly devoted to the Scriptures. By being relentlessly devoted to the Scriptures. All right? You have to, as a church, every church has to test everything by the Word of God. That's how you know. That's how you know who is from God and who isn't, is, is, is being relentlessly devoted to the Word of God. You know, because of COVID, I mean, but even before COVID, but especially now because of COVID, lots of people have wandered away from church, and if they go to church at all or in any way whatsoever, they're watching on TV. So I just want to say to the people who I love online, if you can be in church, you should be in church. It's a great tool. It's a great tool if you just physically can't be in church. But if you can be in church, there's no reason for you not to be. The Bible says don't neglect the gathering. And above all, the, but, but more importantly, right, is you can't know and be known through a screen. But you can know and be known as part of a body. And not just that, and not just that, but on the, on, on the internet, there's so many things out there, you just, it's, it's a dangerous place. And if you, if you haven't read your Bible through and through several times and have studied the Scriptures, you can, be, you can be easily deceived and not know it. And so the way to guard against it is to be relentlessly devoted to the Scriptures by closely walking with Jesus so that you recognize the voice of Jesus. And that's how it works. And that's what Jesus actually says here in this passage, right? That his sheep recognize his voice, Right? So if you are a Christian, if you have the Holy Spirit of God, if you have studied the Scriptures, then you have, you, have, you have by the Spirit a sense of the voice of Jesus, right? If, my, if, 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 I, if I hear, if I, if I don't see her, but I hear my wife talking, I think, that's my wife, all right? Unless it's her twin sister on the phone, then you can't tell them apart. But apart from that, you can, I just say, that's my wife, all right? So... Jesus' sheep recognize Jesus' voice. And so if you walk closely with Jesus, walk closely in the Scriptures, you'll be able to tell when someone else is talking whether they're speaking for Jesus or not because you will recognize Jesus' voice in their words. So don't listen blindly to me or anyone else. Listen insofar as you hear the voice of Jesus and the uh, and accuracy of the Scriptures. So number one is to beware of the thieves. Number two is to enter through the door. It's to enter through the door. So after giving a, an implicit rebuke to the, to the thieves and the robbers, the Pharisees, a, a, illegitimately laying claim to the f- flock of God, Jesus shifts the angle of the analogy a little bit. Um, uh, because in the, in the first one, the thieves and robbers are contrasted with the true shepherd. And we're going to talk more about that next week. Okay? But um, in this case, all right, Jesus is talking about the analogy of Jesus. Uh, he, he's switching the analogy a little bit. So Rather than Jesus being the shepherd now entering through the gate, Jesus now becomes the gate or becomes the door. Uh, you know, KJV, I think, translates it door, but most of the time in English, we refer to uh, uh, an opening to an animal enclosure as a gate rather than a door. So Jesus is the door, Jesus is the gate, all right? They're not figuring out what Jesus is saying, so he's trying to approach it from different angles, all right? So what does it mean that Jesus is the door? Well, I think it, it, it clearly means this, right, that That to truly belong to the flock of God, to be a sheep in God's flock, you have to go through Jesus. Okay? Jesus is the door to the flock of God. Jesus is the door of the sheep. All right? To be a sheep in God's flock, you have to go through Jesus. There is no other way. 
There is no other way to enter into the flock of God than through the door of Jesus Christ. Okay? You cannot enter the flock of God through the faith of your parents. You cannot enter the flock of God because your grandma prays for you. That helps, but it's not a guarantee. You cannot enter the flock of God on someone else's faith. You have to enter the flock of God through the gate of Jesus. That's the only way. It's the only way. That's what Je- and Jesus came to do, to be the door. And that's what he says. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. Well, what is that? Well, what, that, to go in and out and find pasture, that's a sheep's dream. He will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. That's a sheep's dream because what's a sheep? Sheep are weak and sheep are helpless. Sheep have, sheep have no defensive capabilities, all right? They don't have a hard shell. They don't have, I mean, they can bite, but they don't have sharp teeth, all right? They're just a big, furry thing that can't run fast, all right? That's all a sheep is, all right? So what does the sheep need? It needs protection. It needs provision. What does the shepherd do? It provides protection and provision for the sheep. What happens when you enter through the gate of Jesus Christ? You, become a, you, become, you enter into the flock of God and you have the protection and provision of Jesus Christ over your life. It's a sheep's dream. We're weak. We're, we're helpless. We're easily ensnared. We easily yield to Satan's attacks. We easily succumb to our sin. What we need, properly understanding ourselves more than anything, is somebody better and stronger than us coming our way to save us. To protect and to provide for us. And that's what, that's what Jesus came to do. He came to be the door that when you enter through Jesus, you find all that you were looking for, and so much more. And so that's the problem, right? The problem in the world today, the problem in the world today is that so many people, everybody is looking and longing for something, but they don't know which door to go through. So they're trying this, and they're trying that, and they're looking just about everywhere, and Jesus is saying, it's me. It's me. I'm the door. That, that salvation, you might not call it that, but that's what you're looking for. You're looking for salvation. You're looking for something to make your life meaningful. You're looking for something to give you purpose. You're looking for something to protect you from the world that is totally out of our control. You're looking for something to provide for you in your, in your moments of need. You're looking for me. I am the door. Jesus came, he said, to give people life and to give it abundantly. Jesus is the door to the abundant life. What does that mean? Does it mean that if you follow Jesus, you'll be healthy, wealthy, and blessed and never go through any struggles and hardships in life? I don't know how you can live for two seconds and believe that. In fact, following Jesus might make your life harder. Read the Bible. The Apostle Paul followed Jesus more than any of us ever will. And his head got lopped off for it. Let me tell you something. No one lived a more abundant life that I know of than the Apostle Paul. Because he lived for Jesus. He gave his life for other people's eternities. And he received a crown of glory that he got to throw at Jesus' feet. There are things, the abundant life doesn't mean the easy life. It means the best life. It means the life that matters. It means the life where you actually, because of the Spirit of Christ in you, you actually get to live a life like Jesus, where you get to see the world through Jesus' eyes, and you get to know that if God is for you through Jesus, who can be against you? And you get to see other people, and you get to lay down your life for other people like Jesus laid down your li- his life for you. And you get to live a life that'll matter not 10, 20, 15 years from now, but a life that'll matter forever because God is at work in and through you. That's the abundant life. It's the kingdom life. It's the life, it's, it's the life of Jesus knowing that, that whatever you face in life, it doesn't have the last word. Pain, hardship, 
cancer, broken relationships, death, they don't have the last word because you serve someone who's stronger than all of them. Jesus is the door. Jesus is the door to unshakable hope, indestructible peace, unperturbable joy. He's the door to being able to stand against anything that the world, the flesh, and the devil throw at you with peace, joy, and hope. Jesus is the door. Jesus is abundant life. Jesus is the door. Because of Jesus, we know that no suffering in this life is meaningless and that nothing is wasted. Right? That's the abundant life. And that's what people need to know, and that's what people need to hear. Not that Jesus will give you everything that you want. Jesus will give you everything that you didn't even know you wanted or needed. He'll make you into who you were made to be. He will make you a conduit of your grace. He not only will strengthen and restore you, but he will do so so much to the point that your your life becomes a fountain of living water that flows and refreshes other people. That you can face anything with joy and hope and peace. Jesus is the door. And you have to go through Jesus. A little later in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus would say, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What I'm talking about, your greatest need, everyone's greatest need, everyone's greatest satisfaction, it's found in Jesus. But here's the thing, there's no other way. You can't find it anywhere else, all right? If you've lost something, you're not going to find it any other place except where it is. <laughs> and the fact of the matter is, everything that we're talking about today, there's only one place it is. It's Jesus. You, you can't find it anywhere else. It's there. And that bothers some people, the exclusivity of Christ. That bothers some people, but let me tell you something. Biblically speaking, biblically speaking, before Jesus, there was no way. There was no way. So, brothers and sisters, listen to me. One way is better than no way. The one way of Jesus is one more way than we deserve. And so if you have yet this morning to truly, fully turn from your sin and put all your hope and trust and life into the hands of Jesus, there's no better day than today for you to do that. Because Jesus is the way. And so I don't know, I just, I, I, I have to give that invitation. Maybe deep in your heart of hearts, maybe you're watching online, you're not sure that you belong to Jesus. You're not sure that that abundant life is really yours. Or maybe you know that it's not the case. Because you know that there's, this, there's these things in your life that you have just refused to let go of. And Jesus is saying, look, as much as you think that's going to make you happy, it's actually stealing your joy. And Jesus wants to tell you today, come to me. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the door. It may look appealing, but look, lay it down and come to me. And that's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did for us. He came and he lived a sinless life because we, we couldn't. He paid for our sins by dying a death on the cross so that we wouldn't have to. He physically, bodily rose from the dead. Easter Sunday is coming up to prove that through the forgiveness of sins that he has accomplished on the cross, that death no longer has the final say. And so Jesus physically, bodily rose from the dead, giving us, everyone who believes in him, the sure hope and guarantee that one day we too shall rise from the dead to eternal resurrection life, which is why we can really say it won't always be this way. And there's always hope because you, you, you won't always be sick. You won't always be hurting. Your relationships won't always be broken. Your sin, it, it, it won't always be this way. Because Jesus is coming. But to get there, you have to go through the door. And the door is Jesus. So number one, beware the thieves. But number two, enter through the door. Finally, number three, know you're a sheep. Know you're a sheep. So we've heard Jesus' warning about the thieves and the robbers. We learned that Jesus is the door. But there's also some things that we can learn about the sheep. So in verse 3, for example, it says that the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. 
So what's, what's interesting about this analogy here is it, it, it presumes something. It presumes that the sheep, in some sense, already belong to Jesus before he even calls them out. Okay? Paul's term for that is election, but Jesus just calls it sheep calling. Jesus' sheep is out there. He's the good shepherd. He's going to go get his sheep. That's what Jesus is going to do. All right? And again, the analogy in the verses 1 through 5, right, is the image of a sheepfold that probably had multiple flocks in it. And so from the context, that, that sheepfold probably is akin to the Jewish nation, right? So Jesus enters into the Jewish nation. He enters into the people who had God's promises, who had God's law, who, who were supposed to know God, right, who many of them believed that they were in, just fine with God because they had all these things. They had their Jewish heritage, all right, but Jesus is saying, well, not, not, not exactly, right? He, Jesus is entering to the sheepfold of Israel, and he's calling out his sheep. And what's interesting about that is that the ones who turn out to be Jesus' sheep might not be who everyone expects, right? Because in the Jewish nation, right, you have the Pharisees, you have the Sadducees, you have the Essenes, you have, the, uh, you have just the, the common people, the common everyday faithful Jews, but then you have the, the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the lepers and, the, and everybody else in between. And what's interesting is Jesus, is Jesus is stepping into the nation of Israel, and when he starts calling for his sheep, a bunch of surprises happen. This tax collector over here, you know, there was, you know in, in, in Israel there were sinners, and then there were tax collectors. <laughs> Uh, you know that, right? It's like, it's like the next level. You're a sinner, but if you're really bad, you're a tax collector. All right? There were sinners, then there were tax collectors, right? Jesus starts calling people by name, and guess what? One of them is Matthew. Here he comes. All right? You know what's interesting about Jesus, right? Matthew, as a tax collector, one of his disciples was Simon the Zealot, who was probably a political revolutionary, all right, who hated the Romans, and Matthew worked for the Romans. And guess what? They were both Jesus' sheep. And they, despite their serious political differences, if you will, they became Jesus' sheep and followed him. There was even the Pharisees, right? Nicodemus. Nicodemus, I believe that by the, end of, by, the, by the time Jesus rose from the dead, I believe Nicodemus got saved. He had that encounter with Jesus at night, and then he goes with Joseph of Arimathea to take Jesus' body down from the cross and, 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 and cover it up. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, and so Jesus just blew up Israel, blew up all of their categories and way of looking at people, and he was just calling sheep out of everywhere. People you might not expect. And that's what Jesus does. He goes, he goes into darkness, and he preaches the truth. He preaches the gospel, and you know what happens? His sheep recognize his voice. And they come. So who are the sheep? The sheep are those who recognize the voice when he calls on them. And they respond to his call by following him. It says Jesus calls his sheep by name. He calls his sheep by name. I don't know about you, but that's one of the most incredible, amazing, just beautiful things about Scripture about God, about Jesus. You know, in the book of Revelation, there's this strange passage where it says something like, um, he's going to give everybody a stone, and it has like a name written on it, but like nobody knows what it is. You know, sometimes I have weird speculations and stuff, and I just think, I think it's like a secret. I think it's like a, a secret between me and God. God has a special name just for me. When Jesus comes, he calls you by name. That's the beautiful thing, right? You can be sitting in a room, right? I mean, I remember, I remember being in a being in a room when I was a teenager. Gospel was being preached, and he might not have been speaking to anybody else, but Jesus was talking. Not to not he might. The good thing about God is he can talk to everybody all at once, but Jesus was talking to me, not just anybody. He was talking to Chad Hindley. Come home, son. He calls us by name. So Jesus is the door. Jesus is everything. He's the door. He's the one who stands by the door. He's the one who's calling his people by name. And maybe 
maybe this morning, and I, I'll close with this, maybe this morning, you can just, you can, you can feel Jesus in your heart, and he's calling you by name. He's calling you by name. And he's telling you to come into the sheepfold of God. And maybe by grace, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you hear his voice. This is your opportunity to respond. To come home. To enter into the flock of God. If that's you today, please come. In a little moment, I'm about the worship team to come back up. In a little moment, in a few moments, we're going to have an opportunity to respond right here in this altar. If Jesus is calling you by name to come home today, Ron and I will be up here. We want to talk to you. If you'd prefer to, to talk to us after the service, we'd be glad to talk with you then. But if God is calling you, please answer. Maybe you're already in the flock of God. Maybe you're already in the flock of God. But God has called you by name today. Because somewhere along the way, somewhere along the way, you, you got lost. Or maybe there's some sin in your life, and he's calling you back. Maybe there's some burden that's weighing upon you, and he's calling you back to remind you of his strength and his comfort and his help. Whatever God is doing, he's speaking to you by name today. Please respond. The altar is open. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we're so grateful to be here this morning. Lord, I will never, ever stop being grateful for you calling my name. And Lord, every believer in this room this morning will give you everlasting praise for that day that you called us by name out of darkness into your marvelous light. And Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, maybe today you're calling someone afresh for the first time to you. Oh God, help them respond. Oh God, let not fear or worry or anxiety or insecurity keep them from entering the flock of God. May they respond today to you. And Lord, maybe somewhere along the way we got lost and we wandered off. And maybe today, for some of us, Lord, you, you, you have sought us to bring us back. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our unbelief. We want to come home today. Lord, we give you praise and we ask these things in Jesus' name.